Zing and Pinkowski. I love that, Zing and Pinkowski. And it's not at all surprising with names like that that they are indeed the founders of Opera Atelier, the world's only full-time functioning Baroque opera, and it's resident right here in Toronto. Zing and Pinkowski, Opera Atelier. I'm delighted to be here. For the past 20 years, Opera Atelier celebrated its 20th anniversary this year. I have been talking about Baroque opera, Baroque theatre, what it is, why I think it's relevant, and how it is that we came about to do what we do. Opera Atelier is a Toronto-based company that produces the music theatre of the 17th and 18th centuries. We call ourselves a Baroque opera and ballet company, but in reality, we are producing everything from music theatre from the late Renaissance right through to the early classical period. Uh, everything from Monteverdi to Mozart, and soon even past Mozart, moving even further into the 19th century. The thing that makes Opera Atelier unique, or one of the things, is the fact that we are always accompanied by an orchestra that is playing on period instruments. And by period instruments, I do mean instruments that are 250 or 300 years old, or exact replicas of instruments that are that old. In Toronto, we have the great fortune of being accompanied by Topo Music Baroque Orchestra, one of the finest period ensembles in the world. I began my career as a dancer. I began in classical ballet, as did Jeanette Zing, my co-artistic director. That is an art form that I adore, that I still love to this day, something that I love to see, something that I love to experience. At about the same time as we were working with the COC, Jeanette and I first attended a concert that was given by Tafel Music. We walked into the church that Tafel Music was performing in at that time, sat down and saw the orchestra walk out onto the stage. They sat down, and naturally, we were then waiting for the conductor to come out. As a dancer, you spend your life waiting for the downbeat, and we took for granted a conductor would have to be there. To our amazement, after what seemed like some endless tuning, Tafel Music picked up their instruments and started to play a large ensemble, some extremely complex and extremely beautiful music with no conductor there whatsoever. It seemed incredible to me. I couldn't understand how they were playing together. As we watched more closely, it became obvious that people in the orchestra were watching the first violin, that they kept looking over to the violin section where Jean Lamont sits. And it became clear that through the athleticism of how this woman played, how she would breathe, how she would bow, and she bows to this day as though she's going to cut that instrument in half, it was so athletic, it was so exciting, that we started following their eye line. And over the course of the evening, it became clear that these people were not just watching the first violin, they were watching each other. There was a sense of breathing between the orchestra members, of watching each other, of even smiling or laughing as they worked together. I had the impression that I was watching people make music. And that was a really exciting impression. I never thought of going to the symphony or going to the orchestra as being a theatrical event in terms of watching. It was a theatrical event in terms of listening, or perhaps watching the conductor. That could be good or bad. But in terms of Tafel music, it was thrilling even to watch them. Now, it wasn't an epiphany. I didn't walk away thinking this is the only thing I ever want to hear for the rest of my life, but it was intriguing. Intriguing enough that we kept going back. After a while, Tafel music started moving into the vocal repertoire of the 17th and 18th centuries. This was something of an epiphany. I was absolutely blown away by what I heard. When I started hearing the vocal repertoire of the Baroque period, I felt I was hearing some of the most ravishing the music, some of the most ravishing music and text I had ever heard in my entire life. I felt like someone was reaching out off the stage, grabbing me and pulling my heart out. It was a spectacular theatrical event in a concert hall. I remember at the time, Jeanette and I went to people who we knew, singers, instrumentalists, and said, no, why is it we seem to be able to count on two hands the operas and the ballets that are being produced internationally, not just here, but everywhere? Why are there so few? Why are they being recycled again and again and again? But we never hear any of the composers that we hear when we're going and listening to these concerts by Tafel music. Why is it we are never hearing composers like uh, Charpentier, Rameau, Mondonville, uh, Galliano? We were told by people who we respect a great deal, the reason this work is never produced any longer is because it doesn't work any longer. People have changed too much. Audiences have changed. Artists have changed. It doesn't work. That was a catchphrase that we heard again and again. 
When I ask these same people, have you ever seen a production of something by any of these composers, 100% of the time the answer was no. When I asked, have you ever been involved in a production by any of these composers, 100% of the time the answer was no. So I was essentially being told what I was hearing in concert that was so thrilling, was so theatrical, that if you added costumes, if you added sets, if you added makeup and lighting, that somehow it was going to unravel. It would no longer work any longer. It made no sense to me then. It certainly makes less sense to me now. And that was really the beginning of Jeanette and myself starting to do some, uh, doing some research on our own, just into what, what these productions were what they were in the 17th and 18th centuries, and whether or not they could speak to us now. First of all, as dancers, we decided that we would find out what is the choreography of this period. Why is it whenever we're on stage and we have to dance something that is called a minuet or a gavotte, we're given strange, embarrassing, effete pieces of choreography that choreographers would make up saying, well, these were danced by aristocrats, and aristocrats were bored, they had nothing to do, they didn't work, and more than likely, uh, this is how they amused themselves. And at the same time, we knew that the minuet was the most popular dance in Europe for 200 years. And yet it certainly had to be more than what we were being given to do. Our research took us first to the Library of Performing Arts in New York at the Juilliard, a spectacular resource where we found out to our amazement that it was possible to recreate precisely what dances of the 17th and 18th centuries looked like. Because it was a form of choreology that had been created at the time, where you were able to read precisely what dances were and put them together with music. This was an exciting thing to find out. It was, uh, it was thrilling to finally understand what a minuet was, what a saraband was. It wasn't thrilling just for us, it was thrilling for instrumentalists and singers as well. If you don't know what the dance steps are of a piece of music, how can you possibly know how fast or how slow to play it? How can you play a Bach dance suite that is, has something marked saraband if you don't know what a saraband is? We may not all waltz, but we all have an idea of what waltzing is about. You can waltz slowly, you can waltz quickly, but there comes a certain point that waltzing is no longer possible. I can sense physically ideas here, not just ideas of ideas, but somehow it's, it's really present here. And we began just by plugging a tape recorder into the wall at the Royal Ontario Museum and performing in period costumes. There were so many people who came on a weekly basis to watch that the fire marshal told us we couldn't do it any longer, that we would have to move into the lecture hall. We moved into the lecture hall with a couple of singers and instrumentalists from Tafel Music. Within just a couple of productions, we were once again told that we would have to leave. There was simply too big a public response. We moved to the Art Gallery of Ontario for three productions. And finally, after our last production, which was Julius Caesar in Egypt by Handel, there were so many people waiting outside to get in, and we were so desperate to sell tickets, we let everyone in, breaking all of their security regulations, and we were told that we would never be able to come back again. We moved into the Macmillan Theatre, which was the beginning of that terrifying da downward spiral as you have to start finding enormous amounts of money dealing with a union house. But we moved into the Macmillan Theatre and shortly after we were picked up by David Mervish, bless his heart, who put us on his season for three years and really built our audience and built our profile in Toronto. We now have a wonderful home in the Elgin Theatre where we produce twice a year, soon it will be three times a year, and continue to tour internationally. Baroque theater, Baroque opera, is something that is meant to ravish the senses. The audience is not meant to be a voyeur, they are meant to be participants. It wasn't about an actor feeling things on stage. The actor was told he mustn't feel things. The important thing was the actor made the audience feel. The actor was there to make the audience feel what he described. People believed if an actor became too emotionally involved, that that was bad acting. People didn't go to the theatre to see emotion. They didn't go to the theatre to see life. They went to the theatre to see art. It was the actor's job to make certain that being in the theatre was a cathartic experience for the audience. That by the end, you hadn't watched them go through rage, jealousy, betrayal, love. You had gone through rage, jealousy, betrayal, love. 
that you left the theater having been through such an emotional roller coaster that you left feeling cleansed, you left feeling clean, you left perhaps being able to deal with that almost unbearable pain of being a human being. I said that Baroque theater is meant to ravish the senses. That means it's not all seriously profound. Some of it is simply meant to be beautiful to look at. I'm going to show you an example of a scene from Per Se. I want to show you an example of what a dance from notation looks like from this period. Uh, Jeanette is dancing with castanets, not because she is Spanish, but because she is representing someone who is exotic. The piece of music that we're playing is a piece that was popular throughout the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries, with tremendous amount, numbers of variations made on this theme. Jeanette is doing a dance that would have been considered absolutely acceptable for someone who was portraying, for example, someone like a Muslim princess in Lully's army. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.